Hey there, calculus kids. This is Mr. Bean. And in today's lesson, we're going to talk about critical points and also extrema, like maxes and mins. Hopefully, part of this is going to be a little bit of a review for you, but I do want to clarify just a couple things before we jump into critical points. So we have this thing called an extreme value theorem. It's pretty common sense. And that is, if you have a function over this interval a to b, and it's continuous, you would have to have at least one minimum and one maximum. So what I mean by that is, I'm just going to draw a quick little graph here. If I have some function that looks like this, goes down. So you can see I have a maximum there, at least one. In fact, I have two. And then I've got some different minimum points. This That's what this theorem says. It's just saying you've got to have at least one. Now, sometimes it's a little tricky if you had a straight line that you were cutting into a segment from A to B. So if you had just one horizontal little segment like this, sometimes kids will get confused. Well, where's the max and min on this one? It actually is everywhere. Every single one of these points represents a maximum and every single one of these points represents a minimum. Now there's a cool little expression we could talk about that also talks about extreme value theorem with uh, all of the different points, but this is just the basic idea of what that is. Now let's talk about global and local extrema. Extrema is a fancy word for just talking about a max or a min. That's what that is, a max or a minimum point for extrema. Now you'll see in some textbooks, it'll say global or local. Some teachers will use this. You'll also see absolute or relative extrema or max and min. So it just depends on your teacher. It depends on the textbook. I am going to be using absolute and relative. That's how I will talk about this. I'm used to doing it that way. But they mean ex global and absolute are exactly the same thing. Local, relative, they mean exactly the same thing. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about this graph and what do we have going on here. So this is absolutely the lowest point out of all of these graphs. So you look at the y values, this one has the lowest point. So we consider this an absolute minimum. That's an absolute min. Now, as we travel along up here, you have this open circle going on, and then you have a dot above it. So what is that? This is the highest point of any point along this thing. And so it is an absolute max. There is no point higher than this one. And so we know for sure it's absolutely the maximum point. All right, now let's go along here. Now this is weird. You have a jump function going on here. So it can't be an absolute anything because we've already identified the absolute min and the absolute max, but is it a relative or is it nothing at all? The way you figure this out is you have to construct yourself a little open interval. So what I like to do is I think, okay, right below it, I'm just going to construct an open interval right along this interval here. And so to the left of this point, does do I have a graph? Yes, I do. To the right of this point, I have a graph. It's up here, but it still is, a, is still is part of the function. The domain exists everywhere in here. So this point is lower than the points within this little open interval. So this represents a relative minimum. Okay, let's do this again for this point. So now we have, I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna come right down here, right below it, and just think, okay, I'm gonna construct myself an open interval right there. And is this point on the left of it and on the right of it, is it lower than the other points? It's lower than the points here. It's lower than the points here. Therefore, this represents a relative minimum. Now we come here, these mountain peaks and valleys, so this is like a little valley, that's the easiest. Those are the ones that we're so used to. So that one's easy, that one's just a relative min. We know it's lower than the points that are around it. Now we come to this last one and this is weird. Now I'm gonna tell you right now, there's controversy. There's controversy among mathematicians who actually do not agree on whether or not this is considered a relative maximum or nothing at all. In fact, if you were to ask your teachers, I'm guessing about half of them would say that this is a relative max, and another half would say, no, this is not a relative max. Let me tell you why, and I'm gonna tell you how they're not gonna ask this on the AP exam. I, okay, I can almost guarantee it. I can't totally guarantee it, but the reason I'd say they're not gonna ask it is because there's so many people that disagree. Books say it differently. I've seen professors have different arguments and proofs as to why it is a relative max or not, okay? So let me just sh explain to you that I would tell teachers that don't mark this wrong if you say it's a relative max but you need to ask your teacher what they expect of you. So what, what do they want to go with this? For my own students, I would tell them, I'm not gonna mark this right or wrong if you say something about that being a relative max. Okay, so here's how it would be a relative max. If you say this is higher than all the points on its domain, so if this is some function and it's higher than these points that are near it, 
then it would be relatively higher. It's a relative max. So that makes sense to me. But the problem is that you can't have an, if you construct an open interval right below this, so if we construct this open interval down here, there are points on the left, but there are not any points on the right. So when you cons construct this open interval, how do you have a relative maximum when it's not relative to something over here on the right? There's nothing there. So the argument against this being a relative max is that there it's, it doesn't even exist over here on the right. So it can't be relative to any points. The argument for it being a max is that some mathematicians will say, well, it's only talking about it's relative to points on the domain. So this is where its domain exists and therefore it is higher than those. Okay, so for my students, I'm okay if you call this a relative max, but understand that a lot of teachers and a lot of mathematicians would not consider this a relative max at all. So just double check with your teacher on that. But these, this is a absolute min. The endpoints always can be an absolute min or absolute max. If it's the absolutely lowest point, you're fine on that. So here's how we do this. Let's label this graph and talk about all of the different type of extrema and we're gonna identify the type and where they occur. So here's how we start off. Let's just start on the left and work our way to, over. So this one, this point right here, is it lower than any other points? Yes, it is. So I'm gonna write this out as an absolute, I'm gonna abbreviate, absolute minimum. So absolute min of, now we're gonna, we're gonna say of the value of one. So it has a value of one. We say absolute minimum of one at the point x equals, so we say at x equals negative three. That's how we can write this out. An absolute minimum of one at x equals negative three. It's important to understand that the y value and the x value are completely different on this. So the value of the minimum is a one. All right, let's keep going now. Moving on, what do we have here? This is a maximum point. Is it, is it relative or absolute? This is absolutely the highest point. So we'll say absolute max of, now what's the y value of that point? Five, so I say five, at x equals, and then the x value of that point is zero. Moving along, now I have an open circle. Open circle is nothing, I'm not gonna have anything there, but what about down here? So I have my constructed open interval right there. This open interval, is this lower than the points to the right of it, and is it lower than the points on the left of it? So if you think of the points on the left, the points on the right, it is lower than that. So th that point represents a relative min. So it is a relative minimum of, what's the y value here? Two, of two at x equals one. Now we continue along and then we get here, we have an open circle and the open circle then means that we're never actually gonna get close enough to it for it to be a min or a max. And besides it couldn't be because it's on an endpoint, right? It couldn't be, it's not an absolute max, because we already found that, and it can't be a relative on the endpoint. Okay, next problem. Why don't you pause the video and try this one on your own and see what you come up with? So I have here only two answers. I'll, I'll put a third one down here as a maybe in just a second. But if you notice here, I've got uh, an absolute max here. So there's the highest point at a y value of three. So we have an absolute max of three at x equals negative one. And then my other one was right here. If I constructed an interval, you'd see that this is higher than the points on the right and the points on the left of it. So on both of them. So it's a relative max of one. See the y value is a one at x equals one. Now you could possibly, if you're considering this a relative minimum, right? So we could say relative minimum of, what would this be, of negative one? Of negative one at x equals four. But again, it's an end point where there's nothing on the right. So saying it's a relative extrema is a little tricky. That would be up to your teacher. For my students, you can put it or you don't have to put it. I'm used to just putting it. So you could call it a relative min because that makes sense to me, but don't stress about the endpoint ones unless it's an absolute min or max. You must put that. that. There's no question on those. Now, what I want you to do on this one, just real quick, put a dot on everywhere you see either a minimum or a maximum. Just put a dot on it. So we have these points here. And now we're gonna come back to this after you've labeled it, we're gonna come back to this and define. So flip your page over, we're gonna find what is a critical point. So a critical point is a point that has a possibility of being an extrema, or in other words, a possibility of being a max or min. So it might be a max or min, we don't know if it is, it just might be. That's what a critical point is. So if we look back, at, get that written down. If we look back at the graph, what do we know about the derivative of each of these max and min points. 
So the derivative right here, we know on that nice smooth maximum point, we know that the derivative will equal zero. It has a horizontal tangent line. Down here is another horizontal tangent line, f prime equals zero. Here, f prime equals zero. This one, f prime equals zero. Well, holy cow, they're all equal zero, except for this one. This one's different. On this one, we have f prime. It was a corner. If you remember that, it's a sharp corner. f prime does not exist. Does not exist. So it is possible for us to be able to have a maximum or minimum. We're going to look and see, does the derivative equal zero or does the derivative not exist? Because if those two things happen, you might have a max or min, which then leads us back to how do you find a critical point? So one of the things you check is that f prime does not exist. If the first derivative does not exist, that is a critical point. And if the first derivative equals zero, that is also a critical point. Now again, critical point does not mean you have a max or min. It means you might have a max or min. That's what critical points are. In other lessons in this unit, we're going to do several different ways of how to determine if you have a max or min. For this lesson, we're just trying to find where are those candidates or where are those possibilities. And that's what critical points are. So let's put it to work. Let's do it. Two examples here. So the first one, we first have to take the derivative of our functions. So f prime equals 3 comes down. Now that's x squared minus 9. So after you take that, you then think, all right, is there any place where this does not exist? x squared minus 9, can it, is it possible for that derivative to not exist? No. x squared minus 9, there's nothing that would, would cause any issues on the domain of that thing. So we don't have to worry about that. But we can figure out when this derivative equals 0. So when we solve this, we x squared equals 9. And then x equals, don't forget this, square root both sides, plus or minus 3. So those are our critical points. There are two critical points, a positive 3 and a negative 3. Those are candidates for having max and mins. And if you think about a cubic function, remember what a cubic function does? It goes something like this. So I'm guessing that's a really good chance that those two points are where we have our minimum and our maximum of the cubic. Okay, we don't guarantee it yet. There's other things later we'll do. So that's just critical points. It's a possibility that that represents those mins and maxes. Let's do the next one. So we have this thing here we're gonna take the derivative of, but before I would prefer to rewrite this so I can see how to use the power rule. So it's raised to the negative one half because this is in the denominator. And now derivative g prime of x equals negative one half four minus x squared raised to the, now subtract one, we get negative three halves. Don't forget the onion rule. <laughs> I mean the chain rule. Remember onions make you cry. So chain rule is negative two x. And is that it? Yep, derivative of the inside would give us negative 2x. Okay, so let's clean this up just a little bit. I see the negative and the negative will make it positive. The 1 half times 2 cancels. So I have a fraction, but the only thing that's going to be in the numerator is the x. And the only thing in the denominator is this radical here of 4 minus x squared raised to the third power. When does the derivative not exist? This is the derivative. It does not exist if we have a zero on bottom, right? If we have a zero in the denominator, that would give us a problem. So what we want is we want to think, okay, four minus x squared, if that was, we can't let that be zero, right? So if we solve that, we get x squared cannot equal four, x cannot equal plus or minus two. Now in this case, although it makes the derivative not exist because the, the denominator would be a zero, these are actually not critical points. So this is a little bit of a trick problem. The reason we don't include these at all, so we're not going to include these, is because it would make the original function not exist. This x equals 2 and x equals negative 2, those are not in the domain of g. So they cannot be critical points. Okay, so that's one thing you have to check. Just because the, denom the uh, derivative does not exist doesn't mean they're critical points because if the function doesn't exist, we're not going to include those either. Okay, so now the only thing left to check is when does the derivative equal zero? So when does this whole thing equal zero? Only if the denominator is zero. So we take that denominator, set it equal to zero, and solve it, which we already solved. So that is our critical point. And remember, critical points would then be our candidate for either a max or a min. Okay, that's everything. So rock that master check, and I'll see you back in the next lesson.